Following the regrettable reneging of Newman on the Anglican Church in its moment of need in the 19th century, as industrialization was changing the landscape of Britain, the subsequent generation of intellectuals, mainly literary rather than uh, churchmen, were left circling around something of a spiritual void. Heffer then is keen to express the dissolution of the godly mind through this doubting mind, which we'll look at now, and then emerge later into a rational progressive mind of the Victorian era, which perhaps the man on the street has a, has a better understanding of as a Victorian mind. Think of you know Darwin, the successes of Brunel, and the, from the engineering point of view, Darwin, the evolutionary point of view, the widening of the franchises and so on. But we do need to look at the doubting mind first, and that's where Heffer shows you that there's that underpinning or lack thereof from the spiritual context into the doubting intellectual. And there are going to be four key doubters that Heffer is going to pick out, often discarded by English pantheon of literary figures today, and they're in fact crucial cogs in the Victorian intellectual process. And you can think of them almost as a sort of Victorian not quite four horsemen of the apocalypse, but four horsemen uh, of the coming doubt in the belief in God. They are Arthur Clough, the gifted and doomed scholar, Matthew Arnold, sort of golden boy in whom the older generation would place their hopes, and you then you have James Anthony Froude, the Carlyle obsessive par excellence, and Charles Kingsley, a sort of fourth one crucial leg the christian socialist let's start with clough though the doomed scholar clough was an arnoldian rugbyan and one like no other in 1837 he'd gone through the rugby process that we mentioned the dr thomas arnold process and he headed to balliol oxford taking with him a vision uh, that he would become a moral exemplar as dr Arnold had wished the great men of rugby to be. Unfortunately, his arrival at Oxford overlapped with the travails of the Oxford movement, which we talked about in the last one. So he had a mathematical tutor in particular, one William George Ward, uh, who would eventually convert to Roman Catholicism himself. And so he was directly involved in this sort of uh, sea of movement and disaggregation of the church into Anglo-Catholicism, then just outright Roman Catholicism. And uh, William George Ward as mathematical tutor is an instance of this. Uh, he's swayed by these currents, you know, ultimately Clough himself will reject that call. Uh, but his academic career is wavered and he underachieved at an undergraduate level, disappointing Thomas Arnold, Dr. Thomas Arnold, and disappointing that rugby and Protestant vision and what Heffer is trying to do by starting with Clough is he's trying to give a concrete example of what a brilliant Victorian character would, you know, in terms of pure raw intellectual and um, scholarly talent, would come up against once you're hatched from the Arnoldian vision. So we always have this th uh, belief that you have the ideal and then you have the ideal put into practice in the real world. Clough is the Arnoldian vision put into practice in a difficult set of circumstances, the ones instigated by the Oxford movement. So Clough is mooted to even have said, quote, uh, that he could not honestly pursue truth you know, in a scholarly context whilst under the fetters of subscription to the articles. And these are the 39 articles professing the fate to the Anglican order. Uh, though the failure of Clough is not solely down to Newman and Tractarians, even his Carlylean influence was a destabilizing factor. Um, Carlyle, you'll see throughout these... these uh, these four doubters, Carlyle, engaging but destabilizing figures. And Clough told Emerson himself, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Carlyle's close friend, before they drifted apart, on one of his European tours, he told him that Carlyle had led us out into the desert and left us there. So Clough fails at Balliol, um, the Arnoldian experiment outside the laboratory, so to speak. And uh, he's, he's too precious a soul, really, to deal with these tides. Secured, though, a fellowship at Oriel College and awaited uh, the approach of 
uh, to Oxford of Matthew Arnold, four years his junior, and Dr. Arnold's actual son. The two, Clough and Arnold Jr., were, were quite close. So Clough was not satisfied, even at Oriel. He went to university college to see if a Unitarian-funded college could be more of his idea of a search for truth. In 1848, he produced a long poem, Le Bothy of Tobin of Wallach, um, which touched on another theme of Clough's Clough's disgruntlement, that of class, 1848, of course, the year of the Chartist in, uh, inflagration, even though it doesn't become a revolt, which we discussed earlier. He, Clough, believed that capital was capable of tyrannising labour, and he wanted to pour that into his poetical abilities, and was, gl- uh, was glad that Gladstone had passed a bill compelling, you know, for instance, just railway companies to reduce fares to their profit margins, um, so they, that, uh, reduce their fares if their profit margins exceeded 10%, I should say. Uh, he reacted to the Chartism failure of 1848 in Carlylean tones. He, he quoted, Ichabod, Ichabod, the glory is departed, liberty, equality, and fraternity driven back by shopkeeping bayonet, hiders her red cap in dingiest San Antoine. So Clough's moving in quite a different direction there to Carlisle, though, um, in 1848, despite being immersed in him. Uh, you have to remember Carlisle at this point is going on to write uh, The Nigger Question, Latter-day Pamphlets, which will grate on his own apostles, as we're seeing. Um, and it's it's the double Arnoldian coming out of the laboratory blow and then the Carlylean blow where his 1848 experience is completely different to where Carlisle goes. Um, that is, that's the true disintegration from both sides for Clough. Carlyle, remember, is calling for the Cromwell, right? Captains of industry and all that. The Arnold zeitgeist also is, quote, England in which change has been postponed rather than cancelled, in which a rising class of semi-educated people, manipulated by those who ought to know better, seems to be moving against reason and civilization to create an unpleasant modernity. That's where Dr. Thomas Arnold started to see the world. And so Clough was lost. You know, his two mentors are going in places that are either disillusioned themselves or um, holding out for a sort of Caesar which Clough didn't believe in. So Clough's stuck, he wants to move away from pure vulgarity of the mob, but also away from Carlylean autocracy. You know, Arnold wanted to have that moral belief, so he does want to move away from a vulgar mob, but the Carlyle autocracy jars with him. You're beginning to see the anticipation of the rational mind there. And we know Mill is swimming around, waiting to come in where Clough will fail. Um, Clough, of course, was an acquaintance of Emerson, and he got the opportunity to sell to America in 1852, tempted to Cambridge, Massachusetts based. This is similar to his Unitarian experiment um, to see if he could live out the Emersonian mold. But of course, that also was not for him. Then ultimately the Crimean War hits and he achieves something that he's after in working as secretary for Florence Nightingale. She captivated him. I mean, it's interesting that it was the female figure of Nightingale that would captivate Clough more so than any Carlylean Caesar. And he worked diligently for her as a private secretary, so much so he worked himself to exhaust, exhaustion. He drafted her notes on matters affecting the health efficiency and Hospital Administration of the British Army, 1857, very famous work, uh, getting Jowett, Professor Jowett of uh, Balliol, to proofread her suggestions for thought. So using his Oxford connections, even though he failed there, he had the connections and, you know, was an effective private secretary for her. He managed to do the Plutarch translations, revised, heavily revising the Dryden translations, and that they're, they're still the trans- Everyman Library translations. I'm going through them in my channel. So he did manage that. That's his great scholarly work. But there's always that sense that he could have done more, something more, an original piece of work or so. But anyway, he dove himself into the secretari- secretarial work for Nightingale. And his own wife, Blanche, gave birth without his presence. This is how much he dove himself into the work for it. He was on the continent working for her. He died of overwork in 1861 with his wife, Blanche, putting in writing that it, this was down to Nightingale. So... That's Clough, 
Arthur Hugh Clough, the great derailed intellectual of Victorian England. And again, Heffer's not playing a fool when he places this man's career straight after Newman and Tractarianism. So you're thinking, he has to swim in that, he has to swim in the, the reality of the rugby and ideal. And let's move on to the second of our four figures, Matthew Arnold, Clough's closest friend, the actual son of Thomas Arnold, if Clough was a sort of surrogate scholarly son in some senses. Matthew Arnold literally is Dr. Thomas Arnold's son. Um, he's the haunt of rugby and perfection. That follows him throughout his career. Uh, admitted so in his Culture and Anarchy, probably his most famous work, he had the saying, is that the ergo was perfecti, be ye perfect. And that's what you need to think of when you think of Arnold Jr. So Matthew, um, despite swimming in the same doubt as Clough, is a little bit more resolute, actually. A um, bit more of a rallying cry to him. A bit more sense of the age of improvement will occur through effort, through force of character. Uh, he's teacher, critic, analyst. Probably the, the, the best broad strokes literary figure in Victorian England. His poetry is strong. His critical essays are strong. His sense of the political and cultural movements of the time is, is quite strong. Whereas perhaps you could put Tennyson as the, the Victorian poet, the wider sense of Victorian literary critic falls to Arnold. His years at Oxford, also a paleo, uh, culminated in a disappointing second-class degree in literary uh, humanities. Partly, Heffer says, is the, a little bit of the falling into the drunkards and dandies of Oxford, as much as a poet is pure poetical distractions. Clough was at Balliol uh, as Jowett became tutor, and so Arnold had a similar tutor called Archibald Tate, now, this was an arch opponent of Newman. So, again, he's still swimming that Tractarian Sea. Just sort of an insight to the man Tate was, right? Tate was a fellow of Balliol, future uh, successor of Thomas Arnold as headmaster at rugby and would become Bishop of London and Archbishop of Canterbury. So, very successful career going the complete opposite route of Newman and all of this while experiencing personal tragedy with the loss of five children through smallpox so this is tate is that can instill in arnold i think a bit more the resolute uh character he needs at, uh, in his university days whereas if you recall clough's mathema mathematical tutor goes the roman catholic route and leaves clough uh, asunder so arnold i think He's such a towering figure, his, uh, well, he should be more towering than perhaps he is in the wider parlance. But if you know your Victorian era, Matthew Arnold is a huge figure. Um, and I think his culture and anarchy as a, a window into the time, his assessment of the time deserves uh, its own look elsewhere. But let's say to say also has Carlisle influence as Arnold. His revolution, French Revolution, his heroes here worship in the heroic and history. He witnessed real time that the, the disintegration of the Second uh, Republic of France, and he felt like he was rewatching um, echoes of what Carlyle had written about earlier. His Empedocles on Etna, though, the literary work in which he portrays the antique philosopher Empedocles, wrapped in a sense of conflict, lack of fulfillment. Bleakness, you know, all of this was experiences that Arnold was drawing from from his inner life as well. Now, ominously, Empedocles commits suicide amidst this doubt, but that's an act of romantic drama. It's already, in some senses, it's so romantic. It's it's Keatsian. It's Byronic. It's already beyond the likes of Arnold and Clough. And I think that's what's important when you think about these doubters here. There's not actually the great action ultimately. It's it's the it's the it's not so much stagnation as stupefaction. They're they're frozen um, with the doubt that they can't they won't do a big action like a, a, a Byron or a Shelley. So the literary cr critic Matthew Arnold, he'll bear his doubt stoically if nothing else. He'll pour that action into his works like Empedocles on Etna. Um, 
And in this stoical sense, he he kind of resembles Robert Peel in his own way. You know, the, the his political demise of Peel after the repeal of the Corn Laws, he bored stoically. He refused the honours given to him, refused the peerage, etc. So Arnold's a bit more. It's more contemporary now, so the time, as I said, culture and anarchy, we'll look at uh, separately. And we'll move on to number three, James Anthony Froude. So he's uh, the most Carlyle obsessed. He's most known for writing a biography of Carlyle. So the great man, making a great man of the great man theorist. Um, he's also seen as a forebringer to uh, Seeley and Seeley's expansion of England, which will be a huge dominant text and sense of Victorian and late Victorian progress. Uh, you know, giving justification to the empire, etc. So Froude precedes Seeley in being the historian who tries to cement up that that Britain is in a progressive his, historical tract. This is difficult this is different to the progressiveness of today. This is the sense that England is a unique civilization uh, born from the the Re Reformation. So Froude is born in 1818, sort of a Devonshire archdeacon. There's religiosity. He's a travelling companion. Um, his father was a travelling companion of Newman, along with his elder brother. In his childhood, he knew whipping. He knew uh, cold dumps into the sp springs of Devon. Uh, all of this is sort of lifestyle of... Just gives an insight of the, the lifestyle of the Oxford movement's uh, disciples. His mother died before he'd even a chance to grow up. This is Froude. He went to a Westminster boarding. He underwent extreme bullying, thrashing by the elder boys. So Froude's not a rugby man. You can see this is not the the, the Arnoldian vision. Uh, so he enters Ariel, 1836, height of Newmanism. Um, his brother would shortly die of tuberculosis. Around the same year, the brother who's more devoutly wrapped up in the Anglo-Catholic movement. Um, and so Newman would turn further Catholic thereafter. It's hard to know where the brother would have gone, but a, a J James remains a defender of the Reformation, as we said. And he's going to write Nemesis of Faith, published 1849. And he's going to write his histories of England, of uh, Tudor England, kind of a precursor to... Macaulay's History of England, which picks up with the Glorious Revolution. So he kind of cements in the whole Re Reformation by backing up Macaulay, um, almost like a prequel to the same vision. And then, as we say, Seeley is going to come back in afterwards. And so you're going to have a Froude, uh, Macaulay, Seeley trilogy of underpinning British stability. But we just said he was moving in these Newman circles. So despite <laughs> he believed in the Reformation as something that was great and expansive for English civilization, but he didn't actually necessarily believe it in the, in the sense of a godly mind. We have moved from the godly mind to the doubting mind. And he would have seen the truest brother through the Anglo-Catholic schism that, that the confidence in the articles were gone. There was doubts, and I think he expressed them in openly sometimes to his detriment. Um, the, the doubts in the articles, again, you have this cloth-like doubt in his search for truth. In Nemesis of Faith, his novel of 1849, he has his character Sutherland lapse into socialism and through through a sort of, um, through, through, he has a doubting, right? It's a doubting main character, which is Froude himself. And Froude also picked up on how stagnant Catholic nations had become in 1840. So there's a hint of the progressive mind there. He has a Sutherland character getting enticed by socialism. He himself witnesses Catholic countries which he's claiming are stagnating in the 19th century. They're going nowhere. And not just technologically, culturally, completely stagnant. Um, no dynamism to their literary or cultural output. And so we could see nothing really alive in humanism. And there's that idea of returning to the womb, returning to Rome. He disagreed with that. And so he embarked to write his histories. So... You're seeing here, Froude probably adds the most in terms of confidence um, because he can give you the histories of England, of Tudor England, which precede Macaulay chrono chronologically. But 
you also have Nemesis of Fate, where he's a character Sutherland full for uh, socialism and the, the trappings of different progressions because you, you've doubted your own Anglican sense. And so that really leaves us with the last one, which is the fusion between those two things, the socialist and the Christian, namely the Christian socialist. And that's going to be Charles Kingsley. So he's the last piece in the jigsaw. Right? It's, it's the You don't hear about him much anymore, this Victorian specter, the Christian socialist. You have Chartist against landed aristocracy or, you know, noblesse oblige against mob rule. But that noblesse oblige almost strays into Christian socialism in its own way. And so let's look at Kingsley, Cambridge man, right? So it's interesting to know what's going on, not just in Oxford at this time, but uh, Cambridge. Uh, he's best known for his Water Babies novel, which denounces child labour. But Heffer also wants us to look at two other works, Yeast and Alton Locke, from a Chartist Christian sympathetic point of view, both of them. Uh, he was a disciple of Frederick Denison Morris, who is the founder of the Christian Socialist Movement, and was a member of the Apostles Um this is a different sort of Christ, uh, Cambridge Apostles to the ones you're going to see in the 20th century. This is the one where, you know, Tennyson could frequent it. Um, and Kingsley then would later become chaplain of Guy's Hospital, 1836, professor of English at King's College, London, 1840. Morris would then uh, later become chaplain of Guy's Hospital, 1836, professor of English at King's College, London, 1840. And he'd bring Kingsley along with this vision, you know, capitalism was fundamentally flawed and at odds, not with the Marxist notion of the worker as being an, someone exploited, but as the Christian man losing his virtue. The, the inherited dilution of Christianity was what capitalism was removing from the world and from England. So those are the four you know, horsemen of Victorian doubt. Arthur Hugh Clough, Matthew Arnold, James Anthony Froude, Charles Kingsley. And you should really think about having a decent reading list at this time. Um, Carlyle's Heroes, Heroism and the Heroic in History, his French Revolution, that's kind of a prerequisite. We've already had a lot of Gaskell, Elizabeth Gaskell's North and South. Froude's Nemesis of Faith should be added to that. Decent understanding of Arthur Hugh Clough's Parallel Lives. Um... And then in poetry, Arnold's Dover Beach, his Empedocles on Etna, Clough's Say Not the Struggle, Not Availeth. And then, of course, something uh, we we didn't, a work we haven't mentioned, you know, is Tennyson's In Memoriam, which Tennyson is the poet, right? So you look at his work more than the life because there's more of the man in the work. There's more of the man in the lines of Tennyson. It doesn't quite follow that rugby and Arnoldian vision that we're looking for yet right there in the middle of in memoriam the lines which sums up the feelings of the four horsemen there lives more faith in honest doubt believe me than in half the creeds and that's where these four figures were at these four intellectual thinkers i think the final work is that deserves its own closer look is arnold's culture and anarchy which i might just park heifer aside and just do my own reading of culture and anarchy and see what Matthew Arnold, the son of Dr. Thomas Arnold, has to say. Until then.